NASA for 10 years, where he conducted research in musculoskeletal physiology, and later as the head of Exercise Countermeasure Project, he conducted clinical investigations of space adaptation and developed in-flight medical devices to extend astronaut stays in space. Dr. Harris holds several advanced degrees and faculty appointments, including Associate Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Texas Medical Branch and Assistant Professor at Baylor College of Medicine. And he is currently the CEO of Vesalius Ventures, a venture capital firm that invests in early to mid-stage healthcare technologies and companies. And one of my favorite things that he's done after those exciting things is that he founded the Harris Foundation. And the Harris Foundation um, invests in interactive community-based initiatives supporting STEM education, health and wealth to empower students to recognize their potential and to pursue their dreams. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bernard Harris. Thank you, Danny. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I must first say that I enjoyed the, uh, the competition this morning. It was uh, incredible. I think you probably, those of you who were there, heard me say, uh, are, are these high school students? <laughs> With all this knowledge, and uh, let me applaud you for, you know, putting up the effort to initially put your, you know, executive summary together and then full up business plan and then have the guts to get on stage and tell the world uh, and share, the, share with the world your knowledge. That's important. All those skills, those things that you're, you're doing right now are going to be the same skills that you need to be successful in life. And uh, as opposed to, you know, when I was in high school, I, I think you guys have a leg up. So take advantage of this. And I know that this evening we're going to have some uh, winners announced. But in, in my mind, you're all winners. So even though you may not be number one tonight, you know, everybody can't be a winner. I think that's, that's important for you to know that you're a winner because you're here. And the other thing I want to share with you in terms of, terms of competition, I think in this day and age, we, we think that everybody should win, right? And uh, it gets rid of that comp competitive edge. And sometimes you have to learn how to fail. And I think from what you heard, remember when Scott was here a few days ago, he talked about failures and things like that. You can learn, I think, sometimes more from a failure than success. So, you know, th think about that. So if you lose, guess what? You're going to learn from that. And the next time you'll be better. And, and then eventually you'll be that winner. But remember, you can't win in everything. You guys got it? All right. So that's my preaching. I'm going to stop preaching. That's it. That's it. You're all winners as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. All right. As I stand before you today, I stand not only as an astronaut, but I stand as a um, physician, and I stand as a venture capitalist. Anybody know what a venture capitalist is? Any thoughts? Uh, someone who helps innovators get started by providing them the money to take too long to whatever they need to do. That's right. So someone who, uh, a venture capitalist is someone who uh, goes and gets other people's money, I'm going to put it a little bit different, gets other people's money, invests their money in hopes that they're going to make them more money. But more importantly for you, as entrepreneurs, I'm the guy that's going to put money in your, in your companies. So a venture capitalist will create, go out and raise a fund, and then take that money and invest it over a period of five to ten years in hopes of recouping from that investment. Now you, want, you met one of uh, what I think is one of the, the uh, most remarkable and successful venture capitalist this morning, uh, Jack Gill. I think you heard Nancy say that he was my mentor, and then he, he really was. He got me into the venture capital business. Now, when I was your age, I was not exposed to venture capital whatsoever, so I always like to, to take the time to talk about that. Venture capital is really the, the fuel for the engine that runs this country. So those early investments and companies like you presented today is what drives our economy. It is not the uh, Exxon Mobiles, it's not the IBMs or the Microsofts, those big large cap firms. It is the smaller firms. It is those nimble firms that actually drive, drive this, this economy. So, so think about that. So I stand as a physician, as an astronaut, as a venture capitalist. Why? Because of a dream that I had as a kid. When I was in your age, I was fascinated with science and science fiction. 
And one of the things that I was fascinated about science was space science. And I used to watch Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Pete Conrad uh, get on those uh, vehicles and blast off to the moon. And I wanted to follow in their footsteps. And I was no different than any other uh, kid of, that, you know, of the time, of the nation, of the world. We saw those pictures on that little black and white television. You guys know what a black and white television is? <laughs> okay, little, right, little black and white television. And imagine being in their footsteps, being in their spacesuit. That's how it started for me. And then as I got uh, further in high school and it came time to decide on what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut, but I started researching NASA and found out that there was not a major in college on being an astronaut. There's still not a major in college on being an astronaut. So you have to have some type of field, ma major in some type of field, and what we call the, the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. I saw another astronaut that was my inspiration. His name was Joe Kerwin. And Joe was the first American physician to go into space. He traveled on board the Skylab for 28 days, and I got to watch him. And you know, just like you know, when you find things that interest you, you pay attention to it, I paid attention to him and what he did. He became a flight surgeon, then later on became an, an astronaut and flew in space, and that was my inspiration. So when I left high school, I knew that I was going to go to college, that I was going to go to medical school, and eventually that I would end up uh, hopefully end up at the space program. So I uh, went to U of H, Texas Tech Medical School, Mayo Clinic, did my training, did a fellowship in endocrinology out at Ames Research Center, and then eventually found my way here to Johnson Space Center. For two years, I did research here uh, studying something we call space adaptation syndrome. And what this is, is when humans go into space, since we grew up in a one-gravity environment, there are a lot of changes that, that happen to you. And so I focused on bone. We actually lose 1% of bone per month. So the longer we stay in space, the more bone we lose. And to this date, the longest human who has stayed in space has been a, a Russian cosmonaut, spent over 422 days. And uh, of course, you do that math, that's about 14% of, of his if it's lost. And at that point, we see no decrease in that. I guess it should go like this. Uh, it looks like it continues, but there's got to be some threshold where it's going to impact us. And my job was to figure out what that was. So guess how we did that? At Ames, we have this bet rest unit in which uh, can hold about 20 people. And we put people in bed in a negative head down tilt. And they stay in bed for a month three months, six months, and a year without getting up whatsoever. So the whole unit, this whole research unit, is geared toward keeping them in bed so that scientists like myself could go in there and poke and prod on them. And poke and prod we did. We did bone biopsies. We did muscle biopsies. We drew blood. We did all sorts of things you can imagine. It was kind of like a medieval torture chamber, you know, to walk in. And uh, we learned a lot. And that was sort of the beginning of, of my research career. And then I brought that uh, knowledge back here to uh, Houston, got a job here in Houston, running uh, our countermeasure uh, facility and laboratory. And what countermeasures means is that we were developing a way in which to keep people from losing bone, but not only bone, but also muscle. But you know we lose about 15 to 20 percent of our muscle mass. Our heart actually gets smaller. We lose about one-fifth of our blood volume and, uh, in space. And we're not able to fight off illnesses like we, like we are here on Earth. So you might wonder, why do we put astronauts in quarantine? Part of the reason is that we don't want to take any, any bugs up in space with us. Now, of course, we take bugs. You can't get them totally. But we don't want to take something like the flu bug because it'll travel just uh, very, very quickly. Um, so, with that as a back, backdrop, I was able to do some cutting edge research and um, develop uh, devices, uh, primarily exercise devices, in order to decrease the adaptation that occurs when we're in space. And some of those devices are flying in the Inter International Space Station right now as, as we speak. So, in 1990, I got accepted to the Astronaut Corps and spent about uh, two years uh, in basic training. And then after we do basic training, well, let me talk a little bit about basic training. It's kind of fun. Uh, I learned how to, even though I was a pilot, 
I hadn't flown jets before, so we go through a T-38 flight school and ground school. T-38 is a high-performance jet, goes about 1.2 Mach. Anybody know what a Mach is? What's speed of sound, and what's that speed? Yeah. Yeah, 300 meters per second. I've never heard anybody do that for 300 meters. Okay, around 750 miles per hour, depending on your altitude, remember, because your speed is going to change based on uh, the, uh, the pressure, the ambient pressure outside. So it goes about 1.2 Mach, and uh, so we had to learn that. We had to uh, learn how to survive in different environments uh, in the water. We went actually to Panama City and and got trained with the Navy SEALs or by the Navy SEALs. That was kind of fun. We went up to Enon, Oklahoma and learned how to parachute. That wasn't fun at all. Do not like jumping out of a perfectly good aircraft. It's just something about that that's just done. Um, and then we uh, went to the desert and learned how to survive in that. And these days we train, we do our cold uh, weather training in Siberia uh, with the Russians. Imagine that, a week in Siberia. It's pretty, pretty grueling. But you come away feeling like you can survive anything. But most of the time, we are either in classrooms like you are right now, or we're in simulators, which I call big video games. And you got a tour yesterday? Did you get a chance to see some of our training facilities? So it's really fun. So we get to, get to do that. And we do a lot of training, a lot of repetitive training. Did you get over to the neutral buoyancy facility? Okay. So because of my second flight, I did the spacewalks, I actually trained. I have about 500 hours underwater in a pressure suit. And so uh, we have to do those things repetitively over and over again until we can do it, do it in our sleep. And so that is all in preparation for being selected for your flight. And then for every mission that you fly, we train anywhere from two to three years. So people think we go through basic training and they assign us to a mission and off we go. No, for every mission, we train two to three years. Why? Because every mission is really complicated and it has a lot of experiments. I'll give you an example. On my first mission, we had 91 investigations, 91 separate experiments that we conducted over that two week period. And so we have to learn all the nuances. We have to learn first how to do the experiment. Then we have to learn if something goes wrong, how to repair the, the experiment. So we have to do that for each of those experiments. On my second flight, we had 46 experiments that we had to learn. And these were from investigators all over the world. So we would travel different places and learn from those, uh, what we call PIs, principal investigators, exactly what we needed to do so that we would know that experiment in, in and out. It was fun. It was fun, but very tiring. And that's why it takes two to three years. But then I had done all that training, and I got a chance to uh, now go into space. I was selected um, about three weeks or so after I had completed my basic training. And, and by the way, let me give you some stats on, on getting in the astronaut corps if, if you're thinking about it. In my class, they had 6,000 applicants. They interviewed 150 and selected 23 in little old me. So once you get through that, that gauntlet, um, you, you feel, again, like you can do, do anything. So you go, uh, so my first mission was selected three weeks afterwards, and uh, I was told that uh, it was going to lift off eight months later. About a year and a half later, it lifted off. And I don't know if you follow the shuttle program, but you know, there are a lot of times when you think you're raring to go and something goes wrong. We went down to the Cape three times before we actually lifted off. But when we lifted off, it was amazing, just incredible to be on this vehicle called the Space Shuttle. Weighs five million pounds. In order to get that five million pounds in the air, we light five engines, three, solid, uh, three uh, on the main uh, spaceship. And my first mission was uh, on Columbia. And then the two engines on the side, solid rocket motors, uh, produce about six million pounds. Add it to the one and a half million pounds, you get to seven and a half million pounds of thrust. And when that thrust hits the ground, guess what happens? You go in the opposite direction pretty quickly. We pull about one and a half Gs on liftoff, so feel about one and a half times my weight just on liftoff. We're going so fast that by the time we get above the launch tower, we're approaching the speed of sound. And if you're lucky enough to be invited to a mission, 
you're five miles away. So what happens? The vehicle begins to lift off. You see the vehicle, but you don't hear anything. And then about 14 seconds later, the ground begins to shake. And then another two seconds later, you get this percussive wave of sound. And also the fact that we just went through the sound barrier hits you in the chest. And it is really incredible. My, uh, my, f my best friend, who I went to medical school with, described it. I mean, he was so, so overtaken by it, he started crying. And this is, you know, big old rusty West Texas guy. He wasn't going to cry about anything. But he described it as... The, the sensation or the emotion that he felt when, he, when his wife delivered his first son, uh, just that emotional. And I told him, you thought it was emotional from five miles away, you should have been inside the thing. <laughs> because I was pressed back to, the, to my seat, unable to move my arms. I had my arms kind of folded here. And um, when we get through that first phase, which is two minutes in orbit, we're accelerating now from 400 or 750 miles per hour to up to 2,500 miles an hour in less than two minutes. At that point, we reach an altitude of 100,000 feet. We drop off the solid rocket motors, and now we're above most of the atmosphere. And what do I mean by that? If I, at that point, could roll the window of the shuttle down and stick my hand out, I wouldn't feel hardly anything. And because of that, there's no resistance on the vehicle. So now the vehicle can speed up, and boy, does it speed up. Going from that 2,500 miles an hour to 5,000 to you know, 7,500 to 10,000, 15,000, eventually to 17,500 miles an hour. And at 17,500 miles an hour, I go from being pushed back my seat to now three and a half times my weight to zero gravity, just like that. And it's incredible to have that first experience of zero gravity. Imagine what it would be like if we turned gravity off in this room. Would that be kind of cool? So some of you have had some physical experiments and stuff like that. You can begin to experiment with that. And so it was fun. And the first thing I wanted to do was to get out of my seat and go up to the window and look out. But I had a little problem. I was so enamored about being in a place with zero gravity, I, I, I was stuck in my seat. So if I could describe that to you. So I'm in my seat, held down in my seat in this five-point harness, shoulder harness, waist, and one through my legs, and it uh, connected through a, a single release. And the suit technicians have really cramped me down, you know, so I'm really in there because that, that liftoff that I told you about is pretty violent, and you don't want to fall out of your seat, so you're in there pretty tight. So I remember when we reached zero gravity, my checklist, which is this checklist that we use to make sure that we were doing things right, began to float. So it was floating off in front of me. It was kind of cool. I said, I'm in zero gravity. Isn't that neat? And then I took my gloves off. And my gloves have a little release. So I released it, pulled my gloves off, and of course pulled it off too quickly. And guess what? The glove went end over end, really proving that I really was in zero gravity. And then I looked around. And the rest of my crew members that were just with me were gone. And I said, what the heck? I said, i got to get out of here because, you know, we had work to do. So I grabbed my, butt, my buckle, I unbuckled it, and guess what happened? I popped out like toast out of a toaster. And I went into this five-point, you know, kind of like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> you know? So I removed one hand and the foot and violently got my bearings. And I went up to the windowsill because... After all this training, you know, all the medical training, all the research, you know, all the training that we did, and the basic training and the, and, and the mission-specific training that I had done, nothing could prepare me for what I saw as I got to that windowsill. I looked down, and there was the beautiful earth, mostly blue with uh, swirls, you know, white swirl of clouds, and it was just incredible to see. Behind that, of course, is this sea of stars, like you wouldn't believe. All moving at 17,500 miles an hour as we are going around the Earth. Did you know at 17,000 miles an hour, we go around the world every 90 minutes, get to see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. It is pretty cool to be an astronaut. And on my second flight, I got to walk outside. So I donned this suit called an EVA suit, extravehicular activity suit. And I went outside for the very first time. Now I'm outside looking at my fellow crew members below. And then behind that, of course, is that, that view of the Earth. It was incredible to be out there. Just incredible. 
Now, I have to share with you one story, if I can, maybe two funny stories. The first one was on my uh, second mission. I was, um, we were in orbit for about a day or so. And uh, let me first describe, my first mission was with seven guys. And my second mission had two women in the program. And so I thought that things were going to be different because, you know, let me, the way to describe, you know, being in the space shuttle and being on a mission, imagine if uh, we got a Winnebago and it was about 30 feet length, you know, kind of nice size Winnebago, and I asked you to you know, pick out a couple of your friends, maybe more than that, maybe about seven of your close friends and family members, put you inside that Winnebago, lock, have somebody lock the door from the outside and say you can't get out in three weeks. What do you think? You get used to being around those people, you get to know them, and in this case, we train with each other for, you know, two to three years, so we get to know each other. And so there is no problem if, you know, you're up there and it's all guys and you got to change your clothes or change your shirt and, or, you know, go to the bathroom. Yes, no, you know, you get used to this. It's like camping trip, right? Except for you can't get out. So my second flight was a little bit different. I had two women, so I went, oh, man, this is going to be a lot different. So I thought. So one day, I'm in the flight deck or in the mid deck where we have storage lockers, and our storage lockers will have our clothing, we'll have some extra food, we'll have occasionally some experiments embedded in these lockers. I don't know if you got a chance to see that in the mid deck. So I was working on one of the lockers in the mid deck and had an experiment there, and in floats my colleague Janice Foss. So Janice Foss floats in, and uh, she, her clothing locker was right there, so she pulled out her clothing locker, she took her shirt out, and she hung it there. You know, it was just kind of sitting there. Remember, we were in zero gravity, so it was not going to fall. And then she commenced to unbuckling her pants a little bit, pull the shirt out, and she started messing in the front part of her chest like this, you know. And what guy, you guys are in high school, right? If a girl was doing that with her hand in the front of the chest, aren't you going to like, you're not going to ignore that, right? You're going to look over and you're going to do exactly what I did. I looked over and I said, what are you doing? And about that time, her hand came from underneath her shirt with her bra in it, and she released it just for me, I think. So can you imagine a bra going end over end with these words, I don't need that up here. <laughs> so with all those darn degrees, I finally figured out what a bra was. It's an anti-gravity device. <laughs> Did you know that? So if you haven't learned anything that during this whole, realize that a bra is an anti-gravity device. And so are the chairs, so are the pillows, so are the blankets, all the things that we have here on, on planet Earth to help us against gravity or anti-gravity devices, as, as I call them. So that's, that's one funny, funny story. The other funny story was when I was uh, on liftoff, which is kind of interesting, and I'll end with this and we'll open up for questions. So on my first mission, I was ill-prepared to go off to launch in the space. I thought I had trained enough. So if you can imagine that five-point harness sitting in the seat, I'm on my back, I'm waiting for the liftoff, the engines fire, we get catapulted off of the launch pad, and we're going on the space room. And remember I told you about that gravity? One and a half, then two, then two and a half, then three. When we got to three, about four minutes or so into uh, our launch profile, uh, I was thinking about all the things that could go wrong, and I was prepared to hit this button and hit that button. And I realized that my mind stopped thinking about all those things. And the only thing I could think about was my legs. Now, I'm tall, so you could imagine being in a spacesuit with your legs kind of right here and having tall legs. Most of my body is in my legs. Under gravity, these legs that normally weigh about, I don't know, 45 pounds or no, let's say 50 pounds, now weigh 150 pounds. And guess what they were doing? They were drifting apart. So as they drifted apart, being pulled apart, I would every now and then have to pull them back together. So I'd pull them back together, and it got heavier and heavier, and they would drift apart again and pull them back together. And so by the time we got to orbit, I was exhausted <laughs> holding my legs together. Because the last thing I wanted to happen is, you know, kind of do this fishbone and be talking like this when we got on orbit. <laughs> Didn't want to do that at all. So anyway, crazy stories. I had plenty, plenty of those. 
One thing I will share with you, and then I, I, I will open up for, for questions, is talk about life after NASA. As you heard, I spent 10 years at NASA. Afterwards, I worked for this aerospace company, a venture-backed aerospace company, and that was my first entree into venture capital. And then I joined Jack Gill and his company, Vanguard Ventures, for about two years and worked as an entrepreneur in residence. And then later, I convinced him and his team to invest in my company called the Salius Ventures, which is a venture capital firm focused in telemedicine. Our definition of telemedicine is medical devices, uh, information, uh, you know, IT, information technology, and uh, telecommunications. And so at that intersection sweet spot is where we, in, we invest in. So that's what I do now. I run Vesalius Ventures in addition to, to running the Family Foundation. So I wanted to uh, uh, tell you that because all the experience that I have as a physician, as a researcher, and now in business, I did go back and get an MBA, has allowed me to do the things that, that I'm doing today. So with that, I'll stop and see if there are any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. Um, when you mentioned your first voyage, uh, you said that there was originally an uh, eight-month gap that was supposed to occur, and you said it turned into a 16-month gap. Mm -hmm. Did you ever know what caused that mm -hmm. additional experiment? Or? Yeah, so the question was about why, why did we have that gap from eight months when I got you know, selected to you know, 18 months. Uh, we had a problem with our engines on the shuttle. They started leaking hydrogen. Our, the fuel for our sh the main shuttle is cryogenic oxygen and cryogenic hydrogen. Of course, you mix them together, they, they uh, cause a, a nice explosion, controlled explosion. And so hyd the hydrogen molecule is really small, and so the seals have to be really tight. And because of that, uh, you know, we had some leaky seals there. They couldn't find out the, the, the um, shuttle fleet was grounded for six months for part of that. And then the other was just kind of the normal wear and tear that a, a ship that goes in the space and comes back and, you know, in a, as a fiery ball uh, has issues with. Yes, sir? Wait, we got a, got a microphone. So you said you did this study where you, you had people in bed for one month, three months, six months. How do they keep, how do you keep them from going, like, absolutely crazy just sitting in a bed, just, just like, just there? Yeah. Did everybody hear that question? Is that mic on? Okay. So uh, some did go crazy. Uh, we had a lot of uh, different types of activity for them. Yeah, some would say they were crazy to do that, right? <laughs> Just like some say that I'm crazy for doing, or we're crazy for doing what we're doing. Uh, so you have a lot of things. They read books. They had, we had television, special design televisions that were up in the ceiling, you know, kind of like in a hospital room. And, uh, and then we had activities, group activities that they would do together. So imagine they're all in gurneys and they would get together and play cards. So you have to have the gurneys, you know, situated in a certain, certain way. But they couldn't get up, not even go to the bathroom. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. How do you find people to volunteer for that kind of experience? Yeah, how do you find... Oh, yeah. yeah. How do you find people to volunteer for that experiment? Uh, people will volunteer for, for NASA experiments. I mean, it's amazing to me uh, because they, they fear. <laughs> yeah, that sounds funny, doesn't it? It's amazing to me. But I don't think I would do that. But I think people volunteer for stuff like that because they feel like they're, they're contributing uh, to the, the progress of the, pro of the space program, and, and they are. During the summer, we would have teachers that would come in and do the shorter ones. So they would do, you know, the one month to three months then. And then during the year, it may be someone like we, we a couple of times we had graduate students uh, from Stanford or from uh, UCSF that would come. And they would be writing their dissertation because you know, what better way to write your dissertation if you have nothing else to do? So they would be on the computer and write their dissertation. So, it, you know, it was various reasons why people volunteered. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering, I think you mentioned that you spent over like 500 hours in the neutral buoyancy lab preparing for, you know, your mission. And I was wondering if you could tell, that's a bit more than 20 days. Yeah. So could you tell me a little bit more about what you were doing down there? As yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So the neutral buoyancy lab is for us to practice our, our spacewalks. And we cannot practice spacewalks anywhere. You, know, you might have heard of the KC-135 or the DC-9 that we use to do parab uh, parabolas. You only get 30 seconds. 
And uh, so you can't get any time with how to you know, work outside. So the only way you can do that is build mock-ups of the space shuttle cargo bay, mock-ups of whatever it is we're going to do, a deployment of a satellite, which is what, what we did. So we had a mock-up of a satellite. If you're putting together modules, we'll have mock-up of the International Space Station underwater. And so we get in the suit, and by the way, it's the same suit, not the same suit that we're going to fly in space. It's not the exact same suit we fly in space, but it is a suit that we used in space that's been decommissioned to be used in the water. And it's, so it's, it's airtight. So we get in that suit with the help of suit technicians and a crane, because 350 pounds, I can't put that suit on and you know, walk over to the, to the pool. We actually have a special device that holds us up. And then a crane picks us up and then lowers in the water. So when we get lowered in the water, we have safety divers that come and get us off of the apparatus. And then we're in, we're in the water. Now, if we were just in that suit, as heavy as it is, guess what would happen if they just let us go? No, we float up to the top. Because it has air in it, we float up to the top. So they have to add weights on the suit. Weights on a 350-pound suit, right? So we weigh us down so that we begin to sink down in the water, but not all the way down to the bottom. We, we, uh, they balance us out so that we're neutrally buoyant. Okay? So that's where the neutral, neutral buoyant facility come from. Now the only problem is that it's good as long as you're upright and you're working, but if you turn upside down, you still have gravity in the suit. You end up on your head and you feel it. It's not fun. And then you get stuck there and the suit technicians or the safety divers have to turn you back over to right you. It's, it's kind of interesting. So you learn what not to do. Yes, sir? All right, so we're going to do a poll. How many people think it's cold in space? Raise your hand. Okay, how many people think it's hot in space? Raise your hand. Guess what? Everybody's right. Okay. So one of the things that, uh, one of the tasks that we did in my spacewalk was to actually measure the temperature outside in space. It had never been done before. For years, astronauts had come back here the Johnson Space Center, and they would complain about being cold, especially during orbital nighttime. Remember, we're going around the Earth. So at certain times, 45 minutes, we're in dark you know, orbital nighttime. The sun is not shining on us. And so we would come back and say, man, it's cold in the suit. You need to do something about this suit. And the engineers would go, it's cold? Well, how cold was it? Well, I don't know. It was real cold, you know, as we come back. So we would come back and say it was real cold. So they decided on our mission, since we're going to spend about six hours outside, that they would put uh, measurement devices in our gloves, in our feet, which are the ones that really get cold, and in to, and something to measure our core body temperature. And then they design a special cube made out of special material to determine what the temperature was outside in space. Now think about this, you guys are, are scientists, okay? Why would we need to have special material and a special device to measure the temperature, the ambient temperature outside? There's no air. There's no to heat There's no molecules. Right, so it's about kinetic energies of all the molecules. What do you think? There's no gravity, so like the mercury or whatever is measuring Right, so what we normally use is a thermometer with mercury, and of course you can't use mercury because it actually uses a combination of expansion of of mercury from the heat, right? But also gravity is in part, part of that. But if you look at just overall measurements in general, we decide that a meter is so long because everybody gets together and they say, okay, a meter is this, so many centimeters, or a yard is so many inches. Who decided what the inches were? Do you know where inches came from? Came from a British king, and they measured his thumb, and that, was, that became an inch. Right? So to measure things, you have to develop a sort of standardized way in which to do it and then use that standard going forward. For temperature, it gets a little bit more complicated because the temperature of a piece of metal is different than a temperature or temperature changes that you would have in wood. Right? So you could imagine taking a piece of metal, let's say steel, and taking a piece of wood, 
putting a thermistor to it, just a measurement device, and measure the temperature outside. And what do you think? It'll be different because of the material. So we had to design the material, work with the National Standards Office, and say, this is the material that we're going to use going forward in order to measure the temperature in space, in the vacuum of space. And so that's why we need a special device. Guess what it measured? Within 10 minutes of the sun going down, going on the side of the Earth, the temperature dropped down to minus 165 degrees. We were cold as hell. <laughs> really cold. I have a funny story about that, which I won't tell. But my feet were frozen Fahrenheit. And my fingers in the gloves were so cold that I had to constantly move them in order to increase the, you know, my body temperature. And you, it sounds like you got some inner workings of, of the suit. The suit is good in dissipating heat, but it's not good in, in cold. My core temperature was 20 degrees. Fortunately, that only lasted 45 minutes because the sun came up and we went from that minus 165 degrees to over 200 degrees Fahrenheit within about 15 minutes. Now, that was cold. So anyway, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> cold and hot in space. Yes, ma'am? Did I get to keep my suit? No. <laughs> now, when I came into the program in 1990, I was the biggest astronaut they ever had. Uh, if you look at the astronauts during the Apollo era, they were about, you know, maybe 5'8", five, 5'10", five, were, were the tallest one. With the shuttle, we were able to increase uh, the, the height requirement. And the tallest you can be in the shuttle is 6'4", and the heaviest is around 275 pounds. So I'm 6'3", and I was 220 pounds at the time. They didn't have a suit to fit me. So they actually sent me to uh, a, uh, the manufacturer of our suit, our spacewalk suit, and I actually got measured, and, um, and they built a suit for me. Guess how much it cost? $10 million. <laughs> for my suit, $10 million. So some of the younger astronauts, like Scott, who is about my height, they will come to me when we have our reunions going, hey, man, I used your suit. <laughs> so, but they have, uh, they've added a couple of more suits about, that, about this size. But I was the tallest and, and the biggest astronaut at, at the time. But we've got some guys that are my size and maybe just a little, little hair uh, bigger now. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, the question, he just uh, recognized me for the first African-American to walk on, in space. I didn't go to the moon. We haven't been to the moon in over 40 years, but in, in space. It had been 30 years. Um, Ed, Ed White was the first uh, American to don a spacesuit and go outside. It had been 30 years before uh, a minority had done that. And so it was really an honor to, to, have, that, uh, to have that honor. Uh, I got a call from the president, and uh, that was really cool. I was trying to figure out what did I say to you know President. It was President Clinton at the time, and so anyway, uh, it was it was kind of cool to get that that recognition. But it was even uh, better to just be able to walk outside. It was just incredible, um, and so as a consequence of that. Uh, many more African Americans and uh, Hispanics have actually walked outside. And the person who has the most spacewalks actually is an African American, uh, Bob Kirby, who I'll see next week. He did five spacewalks on one flight. That's cool. Yeah. Any other questions? We got about five minutes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, uh, the, the question was about uh, uh, considering all the issues that I talked about uh, that happens to the human body in space, uh, does it make sense to, for us to open up space to normal people? Yeah, because I consider me, myself abnormal, so normal people. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it is. I think the time has, has come. Um, I don't think we're ready to send people to Mars because there's still a lot of things that we have to do. We have to figure out some way in which to freeze the bone at the density that it is here on Earth before we can ever go, go to Mars. Right now, it takes a year to get to Mars. So if you do that math, we're going to, be, we're going to have a deficit of about 12% when we get there. And depending on uh, Mars orbit 
in conjunction with the Earth, we may end up staying on Mars anywhere from a year to a year and a half before we can get realigned to come back, then there's another year to come back. So that's, that's a real big issue that, that we have to, have to solve. And there are other issues that, that we have to solve before that happens. But for low Earth orbit, going up to 200 nautical miles above the Earth, I think that's fair game. And we have four companies that are vying to replace the shuttle right now. And so it's been kind of neat. You probably heard of uh, SpaceX. So SpaceX has had some very successful flights. And we, uh, at the end of this year, I think we're going to have two more companies that will also be doing some flights. Right now they're taking cargo, but within two years they'll be taking human beings. The challenge for us, though, uh, and when I say us, yeah, so I'm going to put my NASA hat on, is we will now, as NASA astronauts, be buying seats from a private company. And not only that, but because they're private companies, there's conceivably an opportunity for private astronauts. So now, instead of coming to NASA or coming to a, you know, going to a government, and, uh, which is how it happens now to become an astronaut, you simply go and work for SpaceX or Blue Origin or one of the other, other companies. And you go and you go through our training, uh, through their training facility, and uh, you go into space. So I'm excited about this because I thought that by now that we'd be on the moon. And not just on the moon, you know, putting our footprints in the sand and leaving flags, that we have habita habitation modules and that we'd be up there, you know, consistently, like we are at the International Space Station. And I think the reason we're not there is because government has been controlling this part of space. Now government is looking to go beyond Earth, uh, low Earth orbit, and now this low Earth orbit territory is wide open for commercialization. And you're going to end up with this commerce, this ecosystem that's going to develop. So I think by the time you finish your graduate studies, did you hear what I said? By the time you figure, <laughs> You know, not only finish high school, not only go to college, but get your PhD or, or master's or whatever, that uh, you will have an opportunity to go in space. All right, one more question. Go ahead. So you, um, you study bone loss in space. Uh, many different uh, space station designs have been proposed, like the stands for shore. Would that ameliorate the, the issue of bone loss, or is it... Is it yeah, so the question is about uh, can we produce artificial gravity and is it going to be enough? Uh, I started out my career at Ames where we actually had a human centrifuge and we were trying to spin and try to figure out what is a gravity threshold. So where, what is the threshold uh, where the bone needs, you know, in order to stay, you know, stable? Um, and I would say it needs to be 1G. You can't do like half a G and expect for the body or the muscles to, you know, maintain. You got to do one G. The only way you can do one G right now is using uh, a centrifuge. In order to get the equivalent of one gravity here on Earth, you have to build a space station that would have to be at least one kilometer in diameter. So imagine, I don't know if you've seen 2001 with the, with the vehicle spinning, and uh, that was only the size of a football field. So this would have to be a kilometer in diameter. And so we were thinking about that at NASA. How do, we, how do we do that? You can't build that. That's a lot of you know, material to take up there. So we got into uh, tethered satellites. So what you do is you have this central hub, and then you have this spoke, which would be this wire that would go out to two modules, and you would have engines that would fire and so, and, and, and more than just a wire, it'd probably be like a, a tunnel or something that you can go through be, between the two models, and you get them spinning at one revolution per minute. And at one revolution per minute, it would reduce one gravity. And so, at the moment, that's the only thing we can do. Now, if I talk to some of my theoretical scientists or physicists, they say that once we figure out what a graviton is, I mean, we've named it, but what a graviton is that we'll be able to manip manipulate it and have Star Trek or Star Wars and, you know, that type of gravity within the ship. And I think that will happen. It'll just be a matter of time. It has been wonderful to talk with you, but I do have one thing I want to share with you, and I have to share this with every group that I talk to, and it is the three things that I believe, in fact, know about you. And here is number one. 
Number one, I believe that everyone in this room, every human being, is born multipotential, meaning that you have the ability to do anything that you want to do in life. Now, when I went to my mom and told her I wanted to be an astronaut, you know what she told me? That's nice, but then said that I could be and do anything that I want to be in life. I wanted to deliver that message to you. I know you know that or you wouldn't be here. Number two, I believe that each and every one of you in this room was born multi-talented, which means that there are certain talents, skills, abilities that you have that are uniquely yours. Just think about it. Just talk amongst yourselves. Some of you like science. Some of you like math. Some of you are drawn to sports. Some of you are drawn to music. Those are natural talents that we come into this world. We also have something called a brain that we can use in order to learn other skills. And if you use that brain, you can expand, you know, just almost infinitely the, your skill set. So let me encourage you to do that. And the last thing, number three, which I think is the most important message I deliver to you today, is that I believe that each and every one of you in this room was born for a reason. That there is something special or something special that you're supposed to do. That's why you're here. And your job is to figure that out. Your job is to figure out what those skills are, to utilize every aspect of your being to become whatever it is that you want to be. Not what I want you to be, or what your parents want you to be, or your counselors want you to be, what you want to be. And I guarantee you, if you do that, and you believe that you are this infinite being with infinite possibilities, another way of saying that you can do anything that you want to do, the world is your oyster. The sky is the limit. All those things that we hear about will come true. I want to thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Let's go. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison. Can we give a big thank you for Danny and uh, Boeing for sponsoring this fireside chat? All right. Thanks. All right, just a few administrative announcements. Um, if you were in the seat.